community events and um, a global health and, and environmental health research theme. We hope we've supported you in sort of developing this fantastic community and um, congratulations on this conference today. It's a huge pleasure to welcome to our lovely um, Global University by the Sea from London's Global University, Professor Anthony Costello, who um, began life as a paediatrician and is now Professor of International Child Health. Um, his, the CV he describes to me sounds a bit like a 70s feminist. He's worked with women's groups for years around the world. That's um, a compliment. And, uh, <laughs> absolutely, this is a compliment. And, um, and he doesn't want me to read out his many, many um, titles and so on. So without more ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Anthony Costello. Lovely, thank you. Do you need, can you hear me? Is that all right? If I start to, you know, fade. Um, obviously, my job, I'll time myself so I don't overrun. Um, thank you. It's really nice to be in Brighton. And actually, I didn't start life as a paediatrician. I started life when I was five, coming to Brighton, because <laughs> my grandparents lived here in Patcham and then Enfield. And some of my peak experiences were spent on the front at Brighton in, on sort of, you know, riding things and playing pitch and putt with my grandpa. I kept getting quite emotional. <laughs> you know? So I love it down here. I think we should not. Actually, half of UCL's moved down here, it seems. So <laughs> might be following, actually. Have they got any jobs? <laughs> anyway, um, right. I've got to keep you awake. And I know it's been a long day. Um, I'll just say a few... I've spent more of my career in resilience than crisis. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about one method for dealing with silent crisis, which is a method of building community resilience. I'm going to say something about climate and the climate crisis, and then I'll drift into some, you know, amateur economics. Um, my experience in 1992, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and at that time, or actually about three weeks after he did, I went to a conference in Iran on tuberculosis. And the keynote speaker was the foreign minister of Iran called Ali Akbar Velayati. And he spoke in Farsi about BCG vaccine because he trained in pediatrics at Johns Hopkins. And afterwards, me and the only other person who'd gone to this conference, because everyone was scared, <laughs> um, John Stanford and I were taken off and we had tea with him for about an hour and a half and talked about, at that time there was no diplomatic relations. And he was talking about the hostages and he said how strong their links were with Hezbollah and all this kind of stuff. It was quite interesting. But anyway, six months later, when all the Kurds were being attacked by Saddam, after, you, you remember, the first Gulf War, and then they stopped, and then Kurds were being attacked by helicopter gunships, uh, Save the Children Fund wanted to get into Iran. They couldn't, because you couldn't get a visa. Except I could get one. So I became the SCF representative for about six weeks. Stayed in that nice hotel. And, <laughs> and it was, I mean, it was like Evelyn War. It was really funny and chaotic. And I just learned a few things, which stood me in good stead. Because much later, when I was doing lots of stuff in Nepal, where I'd worked prior to this, um, you know, Nepal, which had been Shangri-La, became a major emergency. And there was a major conflict for 12 years there. And I think I learned the first thing is that all we should be doing, actually, in crisis is trying to augment or strengthen the host response. And it's really disappointing to see that after all this time, and it was terrible in Iran where all these people, there was one agency came in dis distributing American flags to people as they dished out the medicines, you know. It was kind of bonkers. And Mitterrand's wife flew in and there was a huge thing. And it, it was just all PR and stuff. And it's really disappointing, I think, that after all this time, even now, Donors, universities, research funders, and NGOs, and NGOs are among the worst, still a tribal. I mean, I'm sure you were talking about all this this afternoon. They're tribal, they want to do their own thing, they're not trying to build host capacity, and that's the challenge, I think. And then the other thing is, um, I was very lucky when I got, I knew nothing about Iran or Kurdistan, and there was a very good Oxfam guy there who spent about uh, six hours one day educating me in the history politics, economics, of, of the Kurdish situation. 
And I mean, over the years, I've learned a lot. I mean, one of the great things about being in global health and when you do your master's course, I'm sure you spend a lot of time on politics, history and economics because you have to understand that a crisis is just a blip within a very long historical continuum. Um, OK, so the continuum, if you measure mortality, you're familiar with curves like this. Things are getting better over, over time, in one sense, that rates are going down. Sub-Saharan Africa is still quite high, although, <coughs> interestingly, um, Africa is the fastest growing region in the world right now, economically, and there's been quite a, 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 a steep decline in several countries, Malawi, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, a lot of them are seeing quite steep mortality declines, and I think they'll be followed by fertility declines. But still, this is, this is an old picture I took in Nepal of the guy I passed on the road who was an ambulance. And, uh, you know, he carried his wife on his back for three days to get to an antenatal clinic. She had a hemoglobin of three. And I'd always thought Nepali men were chauvinists, but I wouldn't have carried my wife on my back. <laughs> I got upset waiting an hour in the antenatal clinic at UCL. So, you know. Um, but a lot of people are still dying. These are the figures from Chris Murray. Does anyone? Oh, no, let's not go there. Um, uh, don't believe them. But anyway, I think that the rates are much higher than this. But nonetheless, lots of babies are dying. Nobody ever mentions stillbirths, by the way. So about 7 million pregnancies a year end in, you know, failure or disaster, depending on crisis. Um, and obviously... There's lots of issues around the supply side, and 98% of all money and all attention <coughs> of all funders and Bill Gates and everything is all about that. And much less is about this, the, the demand side of the equation. Uh, sorry, yeah, no, that's all right. Um, the recognition of a problem in the home, the decision whether to seek care, getting to care, and then if you get to a facility, how long it takes you to get effective care. And so the demand side is actually very important. And there has been a shift in the last few years towards building resilience for demand and ability to, to, to get to care as much as the others. Now, by, and doctors are the worst offenders. We've got you know, the biomedical model. Yeah, it's great. Vaccinations are great. Drugs are great. I'll come on to that. But when you go into populations like this in Jharkhand or Orissa in East India, Clearly, there are massive issues there that you can't fix with a vitamin A capsule. And it's pretty self-evident, this. And yet, most of the time, people are talking about vitamin A capsules or vaccines. And they don't think about some of these complex things so much. And that, you know, you're building resilience against a particular historical, economic, political background. Um, and I had to learn that. I went to, I've been doing brain research in premature babies, and then I ended up in Nepal. And I wanted to do stuff on newborn health, and I realised services were difficult, and there was a bit of anthropology involved, and I thought the newborn's helpless, and the mother's clueless, and the father's useless, <laughs> and mother-in-law is ruthless, <laughs> and the community's toothless, and health workers are aimless. And of course... All of that has an element of truth about it, but there are things you can do about it, and I think communities and families are not quite to be seen in such negative terms. Just starting, because I am a doctor, starting with health facilities. This is the obstetric care unit of a regional hospital in southern Nepal covering four and a half million population. I'm not sure I'd want to deliver there, personally, if I was a woman. Um, it's got a little bit better since this photo was taken. But one thing that's interesting, this is infant mortality decline, steady, since my grandma was born there, steady decline, but maternal mortality went boop and over a cliff. And why did it go over a cliff? And I keep telling this to maternal mortality people, and we have big arguments. I think it went over a cliff because in 1934 we introduced sulfonamide drugs, and we wiped out maternal sepsis. And a very smart statistician called Marjorie Chu, now dead, wrote a book about this, showing how obstetricians make no difference to maternal mortality rates, and it was all due to... Uh, she looked at all the causes of death, and sepsis fell off a cliff over about an eight-year period. 
And I was interested in this, and then I spoke to some, actually a friend of mine who I disagree with, and she disagrees with me, about maternal health. And she said, well, it's all about facilities, forget TBAs, forget community stuff, it's all about getting them to hospital. And I said, yeah, but you work in Bangladesh, why has maternal mortality come down? Why is it halved, and yet 85% still deliver at home? And she said, well, it's better access to obstetric care and cesarean sections. So then I got her own data and showed <laughs> that actually, if you look over the last 20 years, this is cesarean section rates. And yes, there has been an upward rise in cesarean sections, and most of them are in the richest quintile, and the poorest women still have no access to cesarean sections. And you go to Mitford Hospital in Dhaka and you say, uh, what's the cesarean section rate? They say 48%. And you say, why is that then? They say, well, the doctors need the practice. So cesarean section rates are going up in Bangladesh because doctors need the practice on rich women. And so then I said, I met a mathematician at one of our global health symposia. And she said, oh, I'd like to do some work with you. And I said, what do you do? And she said, I mathematically model. So I said, all right, would you model three interventions for me? One is, what would happen in Africa if you made sure that every health facility had two drugs, antibiotics and misoprostol, which is um, to treat hemorrhage, postpartum hemorrhage, the two commonest causes of maternal death. Secondly, what would happen if you gave them out through antenatal care and community health workers as well as strengthening health facilities? By the way, half of hospitals don't have those drugs at any one time. And thirdly, what would happen if you did it all and gave it out through women volunteers as well? And so she said, all right, I'll do that. And she went to and did the best literature review of maternal mortality I've ever seen in two weeks, because she's a genius. And then she modelled it into maths. <laughs> and I, you know, I checked all of the equations. I could find no errors. <laughs> um, and she looked at it all by decision tree models and economic quintiles. And the punchline was this, which is if under various scenarios, and we used all these conservative estimates from WHO. If you strengthen health facilities, you save 21,000 lives. If you go a bit more peripheral, 43. If you go out into the community, you could theoretically save 60,000 lives. And these are the quintiles, so the poorest group are the most likely to benefit from the outreach thing. So getting drugs out to people is really important. And it gets neglected because people get obsessed by all these huge WHO guidelines when, in fact, you know, there are three drugs that save your life when you're a mum. It's antibiotics, it's an anti-hemorrhage drug, and it's uh, Maxolf for eclampsia. So, ah, this is another thing you should, because some of you will go abroad to Africa, and I want you to think about this. This is the case of a 15-year-old boy who is under a bed net who was taking prophylaxis for malaria. And there he is, he's just been throwing up all night. And he's got a very high temperature and a pulse rate of 160 and a severe headache and he's got malaria. And he could have died if it wasn't for the fact that his parent carried with him some uh, drugs, some anti-malarials. And I know this because actually this picture was taken a week ago and it was my son. And I'd taken him on, I'm in trouble, work experience to Malawi. They get two weeks from their school. And all his mates were going to sort of the garage or the office. So I said, come to Malawi. And I only forgot the anti-malarial one day. But don't tell my wife. And he got sick. He got really sick. And I had to zap him with la. And he got better quite quickly. But it brought home to me, I bought some serious, you know, treatment. And so I'm going to revise all guidelines to my staff that you have to carry with you treatment as well as prophylaxis. Anyway. Uh, right. Um, yes, telling people what to do by health education, giving messages for behaviour change. We did a randomised controlled trial of this 20 years ago with Alison Bowen. And we did it in Kathmandu and gave uh, two doses of quite intense health education. And it had no impact whatsoever on knowledge, attitudes or behaviour in women, poor women in the slums of Kathmandu. And 
at the time, we thought, <coughs> why is that then? And I remember talking to an audience like this and giving the results, and a woman put her hand up and said, you didn't seriously expect to change behaviour, did you? And I said, well, I, you know, doctors are taught that you're supposed to give information to your patients. And I, she said, yes, but you know about um, Bandura's social cognitive model. And I sort of paused and rushed off to read about it. And she said, look, it's all about peer messages. You know, you only change behaviour because of, you know, constant change from your, your peers and your self-efficacy and all this stuff. So... Um, we then thought, well, look, if we can't change behaviour in Kathmandu, what are you going to do out in remote areas? And we heard about this, which was a, a study done in Bolivia, Save the Children Fund, very smart psychologist <laughs> called Lisa Howard Grabman, who worked with women's groups in Bolivia and set up a system to talk about maternal and newborn problems every month. But they didn't evaluate it properly, so... At the risk of, <laughs> uh, I am a randomista. Um, uh, I, I don't think you always use randomised control trials at all, but I think there is a place for them. So we did a cluster randomised control trial in remote part of Nepal with my colleagues Dharma Manandar and all his staff at Mira, and we did this and we gave uh, some of the women cameras to to tell us about their lives and they showed all kinds of pictures about their context and about what giving birth at home is like and uh, the health service they have, which is a shaman, the drum, and usually a chicken to sacrifice and various things. So that was very interesting. And what we were essentially testing and have done in a number of trials is what's called a community action cycle to build resilience, if you like. And so they spend the first three or four months talking about problems. Why do children die? Is it an evil spirit? Is it a, you know, uh, a curse or a witch? Or is it biomedical? Or do you live with both? And then what can you do about it? And how could they plan to do things? Implementing some strategies and then evaluate them. The strategies they had were things like... Um, make their own clean delivery kits because they couldn't get one. You know, the government ones... Local funds, um, we gave them picture card games uh, because to, to link problems and preventive solutions, they needed pictures because they were illiterate. And it was a cluster randomised trial. This was randomly selected clusters. Each of those clusters is about uh, 60,000 population. And you might immediately say, well, the women's group area here will contaminate the control area. But in Makwampur district, these borders are like 10,000 foot mountains or raging rivers. So it was actually designed geologically to do cluster randomised control drugs. <laughs> um, and these were, you know, so we had these sort of picture car games. And it was pretty clear early on to, to the epidemiologist I was working with, David Osrin, who's a total sceptic, and said, this can't work because only 8% of married women of reproductive age are in the groups. So if you had 8% coverage of a vaccine, you wouldn't have a big population impact. So I kind of agreed with him. I said, look, it's social. You know, it's different. Let's see what happens. So we waited three and a half years. And then he said, I think you're going to like these findings. And we found in the areas where there were women's groups, with only 8% of women joining them, a 30% reduction in newborn mortality. And actually, even though it wasn't a primary hypothesis of the trial, a significant reduction in paternal mortality. So we thought, great, this is amazing. Publish it in The Lancet, which we did. We waited for all the plaudits. Um, and then I would go to medical conferences, because everyone's asleep by the time you've been talking about women's groups. I said, we've discovered a new PCR method for DNA. So Melanie immediately wakes up. <laughs> says, Did I miss something? This is my one stage joke. Uh, participation in the community for reproductive <laughs> uh, to reach the women and children who do not attend <laughs> the DNAs. 
And of course, it is, you see, I then say, well, actually, PCR amplifies a DNA message. And what you have is a facilitator of a group, and she reaches out to the 8% of American women and reproductive age in the groups. But then the newly pregnant women, it goes up, start joining the groups. And then all of those women in the group start going out and finding the other pregnant women. And so the whole thing amplifies. And so social interventions are different from biomedical ones. And it all sort of takes off. you know. And women chatting is quite an interesting phenomenon. Because it's three-dimensional. It's not two-dimensional. It's quite complicated. So anyway, our funders who were... Sorry, Rob. DFID and WHO were not interested at all. They said, you, you're not publishing this, are you? And we said, yes. They said, women chatting, reducing maternal mortality. This is a disaster. You can't say this. <laughs> so we set up six other trials because we kind of knew... They were right. You should never change policy on the basis of one trial. You wouldn't change a drug policy on the basis of one. So you have to do multiple. So we've got a whole number of other studies that have been done, and some uh, only two of them have been published. And I'm going to share some confidential results. So this was one of our... He was in the first... Uh, 92, he came to the UCL and did a master's. And you get the fantastic thing about global health, you get students who clearly know more than anybody that's teaching them. And he was one. And he used to see, he didn't do very well on essays, but he'd just sit there for a centre and occasionally put us right, because he was a proper community development person. And anyway, we kept in touch, and he and his wife set up an NGO. He was head of Action Aid, actually, in India for a while. And then he went back to where he comes from in Jharkhand, they set up an NGO. And we got them some money, and we decided to repeat the Makwampur study from Nepal. And he did it in Jharkhand, a better designed study actually, more clusters, bigger study. And we published this about nearly two years ago now, wow. And it was very reassuring that we found an even bigger effect, high baseline neonatal mortality rates. We found, we also made a second primary outcome of maternal depression. And we found a 57% reduction in moderate depression not mild. And that was reassuring because it made us think, God, this really does work. And it wasn't just luck. In, and it does have an impact on hard outcomes with a randomised controlled trial. And then the economists crawl all over the data and come up with things about decision making and agency being changed. And everyone says, well, look, how does this work? And clearly it's very complex because you've got things like it does change behaviour safe delivery kits, hand washing there's social aspects, family support solidarity, you do change breastfeeding rates, funds enable you to get to care a bit more quickly, etc but it's, it's actually deeper than that because it's also about um, empowerment, about building critical consciousness in the community it's about their ability to take decisions Interestingly, in Bangladesh, a lot of the women that have been in this for a long time are now seeking office in local elections <laughs> and causing a lot of trouble. Uh, good trouble, you know, which is... So it's, it's not just behaviour change. Um, and then we did another big study in Bangladesh, <coughs> which took a long time and was in three big areas, and we analysed... The biggest study, a half a million population, and we did all this, and there was no impact. And so we got a bit upset about that, and we thought, that's odd. Why is Bangladesh different? And we thought about it a lot, and we came up with three reasons why it might not have worked. One was that Bangladesh is quite population dense, and when we worked it out, and you'd think we should have known this, but we didn't. Um, we didn't have the same dose. The women's groups were more dilute in Bangladesh than India and Nepal. Maybe they weren't doing it right, but I thought the groups looked as good there as anywhere else. <coughs> but maybe we thought in traditional society da -da, you, uh, that maybe there's barriers for women to talk to one another and chat in Bangladesh compared to elsewhere. So we, we tripled the coverage in the areas we've been working in, and we kept it going for another two and a half years. 
And then we set up two other studies in, in uh, Africa, in Malawi, and again, they formed groups, very lively groups. They did a lot of stuff on things like bed nets, they set up businesses, uh, they did health education and discussions, they sorted out bicycle ambulances. All of them, interestingly, did Dimba Gardens. And our funder, who was, um, better remain nameless, um, didn't like this. They said, you're doing a neonatal study and all the women are doing kitchen gardens. We don't like this. We want messages. And we, we tried to you know, keep them happy and then they insisted on us giving more messages. But actually, what they didn't realize, and in fact, I didn't realize at the time, why did women decide to do kitchen gardening? Well, we thought it was to eat green leafy vegetables in pregnancy, which is true. The main reason is, this is their emergency fund. They make money, and then they've got cash when there's an obstetric or a neonatal emergency. And actually, that's what they do, because in, in Africa, they don't have such a tradition of microfinance. And they gave loans, and they helped with a community radio program. And none of this has been published yet. Actually, we've got two papers in under review. Um, and the Bangladesh one, interestingly, after two and a half years of tripling the coverage, it did have an impact. To my surprise, I didn't think it would, because Bangladesh has got a lot of noise from other NGOs. But we found a 34% reduction, and that's got to be published. And then the Maimwana trial uh, showed also effects uh, on mortality rates. So that's encouraging that there is generalizability here of this approach. And we've done another study, which I'm going to skip over because there isn't much time, but which actually did show an effect, but a smaller effect. And again, the dose wasn't quite right. So we're, we've worked out a kind of dose response curve. You basically need one women's group for about 500 population. Right. Audience participation. I'm going to change the subject now. You've got one of five options you've got to think about in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> Climate change is unproven and a myth. <laughs> Climate change might be happening slowly. There are more urgent priorities to address. Climate change is serious, but there will be a technological and political fix. Climate change is our most serious global problem, and only with focused and immediate action can we address it. We're all stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you've got five seconds to come to a decision. Three, two, one. Hands up all those that believe in one. I should, actually, I should do a Darren Brown here, because I can predict what, who's going to... Right, anyway, uh, number two. Right, you usually get one or two outliers in the twos. Three. Right, then the modal number will be four. Thank you. <laughs> Any catastrophists? Five. Growing numbers of catastrophists. <laughs> oh dear, Bryony, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, your students are in for a miserable year, aren't they? <laughs> no, I shouldn't. I, I, actually, I have. I'm becoming a bit catastrophic, actually, when you honestly. Uh, right. Uh, we all know about climate change. I'm going to rush over this. Um, it affects everything. This is not AIDS. This is not. This is completely different scale. Um, it affects every bit of what we thought about, and we all know about the greenhouse effect. And actually, water vapor is the biggest greenhouse gas. That interesting to remember that, particularly when it's raining all the time, which is might be why we'll, we're going to stay cooler than almost every other part of the world, particularly if the jet stream and the Gulf Stream does funny things. Um, wh what happened was, four years ago, Richard Horton rang me up and said, you know, the editor of The Lancet, and said, would you get UCL to do a, a commission, the first commission on managing the health effects of climate change? And we got everyone in the university together, and it was really, really interesting. I knew nothing about climate change. I really didn't. And talking to all these people did make me agree with that conclusion, and I still believe that. In fact, more so now. And I, th I got quite depressed, actually, listening to all this stuff. Um, 
you know, I was born here-ish. Um, and <laughs> since then, you can look at the amount. And over the next 25 years, you're going to put into the atmosphere more than we've had in the whole of history. So we are, it's a design. Nothing is changing. Kyoto, nothing has changed. In fact, we're going up. It was 6% rise in emissions last year. Um, this is from Shell, who have two scenarios. Blueprints, where people follow the rules and scramble where they don't. And we're heading up towards, at the moment, above the scramble line. We're going to hit... CO2 will not be 0.3% of the atmosphere that I've taught in O-level chemistry. It will be 1% by the end of this century. And that is actually catastrophic because it means we're going to be heading up towards here this century, four or five degrees. And everyone's been saying two degrees is the safe limit on not much evidence. In fact, James Hansen, uh, who you should read, from NASA, thinks that two degrees is already too dangerous. And we're already above a safe level of CO2 at 390. He thinks we should be getting it down to 300-ish. Um, and we know, I'm sure all of you have read about all this stuff and the effects. Um, most climate scientists actually think we're heading up towards 4 degrees this century. Some think it could be more. Um, average figures are misleading because... You, you know that, you know, if we go up three degrees, it will be about nine degrees in the Arctic. Um, it's not going to be uniform across the planet, and there will be this warm patch around the British Isles. Cold patch, rather. Um, then there's all the tipping points. So at the moment, the permafrost is melting all around here, and there's large areas of methane bubbling up to the surface. And methane's 23 times as powerful a greenhouse gas as CO2, which is why animals passing wind has as much impact on climate change as industry. I never understood that, but it's true. And I talked to the head person at the Met office and said, what's going on with methane? Do you know, have you, what's the Met view on this? And she said, well, actually, we don't know because nobody measures it. They can't really tell. So it's, it's a bit scary. Um, and we know, you know, Arctic ice is disappearing, Greenland is starting to go. Uh, everyone says, well, it's only going to be a metre this century, you know, here. James Hansen actually thinks we could be, like, there by 2080, and then it could just go really steeply upwards, a sort of exponential thing. And he thinks we could be five metres by the end of the century. Um, and if... If you go above persistently three to three and a half degrees, everything's going to melt on the planet. So eventually that will be Britain. And that could be within like three or four hundred years. Uh, anyone from Scunthorpe? <laughs> it's not funny. You know, I mean, we are... <laughs> we're doomed, you know. I mean, and not quite. Um, so... We know that luxury emissions are different. Uh, the poorest will be the first affected and the most affected and the poorest people. You know, in Malawi, nobody's emitting anything, really. I mean, the public buildings of Britain emit more than the whole of Kenya. So there is a huge discrepancy here. Uh, population comes into it, but I get a bit worried about all of this, blaming it on high fertility rates in Niger when we're all like me, flying around the world. Um, and I think we'll sort population out, actually. I'm more, more optimistic than most, because I think a lot of, you know, Russia's collapsing. There isn't the... Oh, quick test. What will the population... The population of China is 1.3 billion. I spoke to the top demographer from China. What will the population of China be at the end of this century? Any offers? One point five billion. Two billion. Two. Two billion. One billion. One billion. One point three. One point three. Top demographer in China told me six hundred million. It's going to fall. Russia is. Everyone's. Once you go below two point one, your population falls, like in Japan, like in Italy, like in France. Like we're only going up because of immigration, which is great. We need immigrants for the. Economy. Um, 
and as wealth education. Anyway, let's not do population. Uh, and Africa, when it, you know, everyone says, oh, there's too many population in Africa. Um, Africa's a very big place. And when I go to Milan, I think, where's all the people? <laughs> I don't think there's enough people in Africa, personally. I'm being controversial. <laughs> I'm trying to keep you away. Um, you know, look, India. You go to India, there's people everywhere. You go to Malawi and all that, they're not. You, can't, you, know, you need more people for an economy. So I don't, I don't accept all this stuff about there's too many people in Africa. And they'll get their fertility rates down. Mark my words, it's going to fall very steeply in the next 25 years. Right. So, <coughs> lots of pathways for health effects of climate change. Uh, we'll get more food poisoning. We'll get more malaria. Maybe, but we can deal with that. We will certainly get more <coughs> dengue fever. But again, we can deal with that. Uh, frankly, that's not going to wipe people out, in my view. Melanie might disagree, but I don't think it will. Um, this could a bit, because when I qualified, we hadn't heard of HIV, and it has killed 45 million people. Um, and they could all, you know, I'm sure you've talked about this, some re-emerging zoonoses. It's what Donald Rumsfeld called the unknown unknown, an emerging infection. And as you lose biodiversity, you increase your chances of getting hopping from animals to man. Um, and we are losing biodiversity very fast. Although it's not well measured, there are various views on all of this, but you know, the general view is we are losing a lot of things, and if you lose bees, for example, you're in trouble. Heat waves, urban future, food and oil prices, I'll come on to that just to finish in a minute. Just do sea level again. This is Bangladesh, and I got this slide from a climate scientist in Bangladesh. We work, so there's Dhaka, and I said, what will happen? He said, a metre by the middle of the century will do that. Now, I don't know whether he's completely right, but they're incredibly vulnerable, and a metre does affect a lot of people, and it affects all kinds. You, you think a metre isn't very much, but it, actually it is. And most cities are coastal. I mean, if you go into the Houses of Parliament, stand on the terrace, you're only about three and a half metres above the Thames. So there will be some benefits from this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Now, resilience is really important. If you look at Bangladesh, which I think is a real success story, famine in 1974, 300,000 people died in 1970 from a cyclone. The same strength of cyclone in 91 killed 138. The same strength five years ago, 3,500. Why? because they're much more switched on. They have cyclone shelters, they're thinking about it, the population is more aware. So it just shows you that actually we could be very resilient. Um, and I, I would just say the technology thing is the one hope. You know, everyone in New York in 1890 was absolutely terrified that the, all of the streets would be filled up with horse manure because there were so many horses in New York City. And then Henry Ford came along. And so we could have a Henry Ford and stop, you know, you just extract CO2. But I think it's a bit more difficult than that, talking to people. Anyway, um, we live in an insane... Reed Ian Roberts of the London School, he's written a thing called The Energy Glut. And he's, you know, we're all getting fat. And it's amazing going to Dhaka. When I went there first 25 years ago, everyone was cycling. Everyone in Beijing was cycling. Now everyone's in a car or a traffic jam. And it's horrible. I mean, Kathmandu used to be great, and now it's really horrible. Um, and if we did something about it, we solve most of the things we're trained to be medics for. You know, heart attacks, diabetes, strokes, respiratory diseases from air pollution, depression and anxiety. You know... Um, which describes our lives. <laughs> um, and our framework... Have I overrun? My, my alarm hasn't gone off. I've got two minutes. I'm nearly on time. Um, we came up with this, and it, it was really interesting because we did this with a philosophers and mathematicians and Sarah, a student, and various people. In the, and... 
we came up with a totally non-epidemiological approach. You don't solve climate change health effects through doctors. You do it through engineers and physicists and economists and geographers and, you know. So it's information, it's poverty, it's technology. It's dealing with the socio-political problems and it's dealing with institutional issues. Um, and I think it again comes back to we should be thinking much more long term in our relationships and that's a big challenge for universities for NGOs, for funders about how you, you tackle this we have to have a long term I think developmental view, not a crisis view um, finally, the banks um, uh, in short this is Martin Wolf at the Financial Times we've moved from relatively safe small banks within a small banking system to relatively unsafe giant banks within a huge bank uh, so, 150 years ago, most banks just lend out the money they had and that was it. Now it's all leveraged, leveraged. It's all a sea of debt that we all know about over the last 25 years. Big Bang actually was a deeply destabilizing event for global finance. Um, and the consequences of that has been uh, both good and bad. I mean, we can weigh those up. Uh, corruption is endemic throughout the world. Now, this was, picture was in a Transparency International document. I'm done. Um, but it's wrong. It's completely wrong because the biggest Ponzi scheme in history was the global financial crash. You know, we all hear about Bernie Madoff and his Ponzi scheme of paying returns from their own money of investors. That was what the credit boom was. $62 trillion, that's five times the global GDP, was an invention of the financial system in New York and, and London. So we can't preach about corruption to anybody, because this was corruption. This is pub private gain from a public good, and it destroyed confidence in our banking system, which is, as we know, and I won't go into all what happened to the banks. The, the one at the end is Anglo-Irish Bank, which was bailed out by its government, probably mistakenly. These are the effects on growth and unemployment, and we are going to hit the cumulative effect on GDP next year um, uh, c comparable to the depression of the 30s. So we're, I mean, in Greece and Spain, it's actually worse than in the 1930s. Um, and the cost of the crisis, and this is from the Bank of England, is that the median cost of repeated financial crises is 3% of GDP in perpetuity every year. So if we solved banking crises, you could basically wipe out poverty in most countries and deal with all the public sector needs that we need. And that's simply because we haven't regulated banks. And we know all about the effects on health right now. There'll be a increasing literature on this. Martin McKee has written some interesting stuff about what's happening in Greece. Um, soup kitchens, what can we do? Well, what's really amazing to me is there are very, two or three very simple things to stop this financial mess. Uh, one is to reenact the Glass-Steagall Act, which was repealed under Clinton by Robert Rubin and Larry Summers, who both made tens of billions, millions of dollars. Um, making sure banks have proper capital ratios, which they haven't done yet, and making them limiting the size of banks. And it's obvious we should do this. It's absolutely obvious. And even the, you know, Mervyn King says we should do this. Joseph Stiglitz says we should do it. Do any of the politicians, have they done anything yet? Is not even Ed Miliband is saying introduce ring fencing casino banking so that Goldman Sachs goes bust if it, if it invests everyone else's money. So I think this is something that is a, a very important thing on health, and I think we should be campaigning for that because uh, I think economics affects health perhaps more than anything. And if we don't get our finances right, I was going to go on to food security, but I've overrun. So, you overrun. well, uh, I'll, I'll finish up. Well, food, ah, another thing <laughs> speculation in food. Um, this was something I saw presented to the Congress of America, uh, which is the data from a hedge funder himself which showed that the red circle is the amount of money 
going into food commodity futures by your pension funds and major investors, which is totally distorting the food market. And the effect on that of speculation has been to see huge increases in volatility of food prices, exacerbated by the climate, of course, uh, which we're seeing right now with the drought in America. We saw three years ago with the drought in Russia, which precipitated the food price crisis and the Arab Spring. Uh, but this is another thing that could easily be stopped tomorrow with regulation. And the OECD, of course, came out with a report which said speculation has no effect on prices. Um, strong evidence that speculation exists. Uh, oh, that's what they said. And then I read a, a letter in The Economist, which said there is strong evidence that speculation exacerbated those bubbles. It will fuel the next one. We must limit it. Who were the communists that wrote this letter? Sir Richard Branson, Michael Masters, and somebody else from a hedge fund. So these guys know what's going on. And we're sitting back, and up five years into this crisis, the public health interventions that are needed to simply regulate stuff so that banking becomes boring again and respectable haven't been taken. I will stop there because I think we should have some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.